Let's stand together this morning. We want to make this song our prayer that God would help us make ourselves ready for his return. Let's sing together. All of creation, all of the earth, let's sing. All of the earth makes straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for a groom We'll be a church ready for you Every yard longing for our King We sing, even so come Lord Jesus come Even so desire to see you, to be with you. We're grateful for your presence here with us today, but there is nothing like that moment when we stand face to face before you. We don't fear that moment because you've dealt with our sins at the cross. 
You've taken them away and we stand robed in the righteousness of Jesus. There may be some here today that they've never trusted Christ. Maybe that's a fearful thing for them uh, to stand before you. But God, I pray that today they would trust you with their hearts and their lives and they would have that freedom and liberty uh, before you today. God, we look forward to that day, but God, that day has not yet come. And so we pray that by your grace, we would be faithful today to worship you in the way that you are worthy of. We pray, God, that by the work of your spirit, that our lives would be reflective of your grace and your glory today, especially in this place, as we have an opportunity to build up in the faith our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We have an opportunity today to point people that don't know Jesus, to point them to Jesus today. Most of all, Jesus, we want you to be magnified and to be made much of in this place today because you are worthy. So Holy Spirit, would you give us grace to make much of Jesus for the glory of the Father, for our good, our joy. And we ask it in Jesus' good name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, you can be seated for a moment. So thankful that you're here today to worship the Lord with us. The Lord's given us another gorgeous Sunday afternoon, and I pray that today's a great day of worship and rest and rejuvenation for all of you today. And if you haven't got your ark finished up, today's a good day to do it because they say the rain is coming back with a vengeance. So thankful that you're in here today to worship the Lord with us. If you're new to Grace Life, if you'd like to know more about our church family, there's a tearaway tab in our worship guide and we would be delighted to get to share with you what the Lord's doing here. You could just put your name on that tearaway tab and the way you would prefer to be contacted. If you have a specific question or prayer need, you're welcome to jot that down on there as well. If you want to sign up for our next Membership Matters class, the next class is actually starting in about an hour and 45 minutes, but that class is full. But you can sign up for the March class. That's on March the 9th, I think. Maybe it's on that green tab. You can check the box and let us know that you want to be a part of that class. It won't obligate you to join Grace Life, but it'll tell you all about Grace Life so that you can better discern if this is where God wants you to plug in and to be a part of what God's doing in this world. We'll take care of lunch and child care too. Just bonus features of that class. Inside your worship God, notice men. We've got our men's conference coming up. We'll be doing the simulcast with the uh, Johnny Hunt annual conference. This year's called Renovate. You can go online and register to be a part of that weekend coming up. Uh, also, Financial Peace University is getting ready to kick off again. A few people have been asking me about that. So there's your answer. March the 1st at 9 a.m. And you can also register online for that, yourgracelife.com slash FPU. And the Grace Place, their annual uh, run, 5K and family run is coming up. You see that in your worship guide, April the 18th. Uh, Grace Place Executive Director, Miss Katie Wallace, is up here. If you have any questions, you can talk to Katie and you can register for that also by going online on their uh, website, thegraceplaceonline.com. And not only is it an opportunity for you to walk or to run and to raise support for this great ministry in our community, but there's also opportunities to volunteer on that day as well. So if you're kind of like me and thinking, I'm only running if some bad guy's chasing me, um, I, I could volunteer though. I'd be happy to hand water to somebody that is running or something like that. So you can get more information, go online, check that out, or again, just uh, see Katie sometime. And she'd be delighted to help you out with that. Well, again, I'm thankful you're here today. We're going to have a great day today together at Grace Life. So let's stand together today. <sighs> you can do it, church. <laughs> Come on, I believe in you. <laughs> hey, take a moment. Look for four or five people around you. Welcome each other today to Grace Life. Meet a new friend today. Invite somebody to sit with you maybe today. How about that?
Yeah, thankful for our God. Amen. Thankful for a church full of medical personnel who always stand ready for anything that might be going on. All right. Is this Eli? Eli, you all right, man? We good? All right. We love that little dude, man. Got to make sure he's good. All right. Let's pray. God, we just pray for Eli right now. I'm grateful for a young man that loves you like he does. Um, God, whatever may have caused, whatever happened, God, your hands on, and we praise you for that. We are grateful, God, that our Grace Life family always stands ready to serve and to help and to assist. We're grateful for the gifts and talents you've given so many. Uh, God, thank you for that. Lord, thank you that we do stand in awe of your great name. You are the Lord God Almighty. Lord, you have no rival and you have no equal. There is none in this world who cares for us like you. There's none in this world that has power to save, to liberate, to free, to heal like you do. We stand in awe of your greatness and your glory. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Watch this baptism video. So Parrish goes to McAdory High School, right? Ninth grade. And uh, we've had the joy of watching Paris grow up. Her grandmother, Miss Cassandra, has been faithful to bring her and her brother here to Grace Life probably 10 years now, I guess. It's hard for me to fathom that Paris has already grown this much. Time has really slipped by. Uh, I just prayed with her before we came down here and just thinking about how grateful we are for faithful grandmothers. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that I would not be where the Lord has me had it not been for, for faithful grandmothers. That's the story for a lot of us, and uh, so we're thankful for them. And thankful for all of your family that's here today to celebrate with Miss Paris. Paris, not long ago, went to church with a friend of hers, and she heard the gospel proclaimed, and there the Holy Spirit tugged on her heart, and she went down front and trusted Christ to save her. Now your journey in a relationship with Paris has just begun. And we're all here, and your church family is going to be here to help you walk with the Lord all of your days. Okay? So, Paris, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in his death, and raised to walk with him. Amen. Amen. All right, boys and girls, come on and join me up here. Ushers, if you guys would come to receive our offering today. Hey, how about it for our praise and worship team who did not get to practice Wednesday night because of that inclement weather. So no rehearsal for today. Praise the Lord for that. Just to step up and go with it. What's up, everybody? How y'all doing? Now, did somebody, one of y'all hit Eli? Is that what happened? Did somebody knock Eli in the head? Is that what you did? No, I know you better than that. We love Eli. Good to see you guys today. Glad that you are here. So you're about to go to Sunday school. And let me tell you what you're about to study in Sunday school. You all are about to go to Sunday school. Let me tell you what you're about to study in Sunday school. We'll get there. Ready? But let's start here. In the beginning, God created how many people? Two. What were their names? And did they obey or disobey? And what does the Bible call that? And even though they sinned, God stepped into the garden and he made them a promise. He promised to send a savior but sin just got worse so god sent a flood he destroyed the whole world except one man by the name of noah and his entire family then the world began to repopulate and they built the tower of babel but god confused their languages and that was the beginning of the nations of the earth and out of all those people god chose one man to form a new nation his name is abraham very good and abraham god promised him three things lots of children lots of Land and a blessing to the nations of the earth. And he gave Abraham a son by the name of Isaac. And Isaac a son by the name of Jacob. And Jacob a son by the name of Joseph. And Joseph ended up living in what country? Egypt. And the Pharaoh turned all of God's people into slaves. But God raised up a man to bring them out of slavery. His name is Moses. Did Moses get to take them into the land that God promised Abraham? No, his protege who? Joshua took them in the promised land. And even when they got in the promised land, their hearts were still wicked. And they went through a series or a cycle of judges. And then the people said, God, we don't want any more judges. We want a king. So they got King 
Saul, they got King David, they got King Solomon, and then the kingdom split. And what happened to the northern kingdom? Conquered by the Assyrians. Bonus points. Capital of the Assyrian Empire. Nineveh. That's why Jonah didn't want to go there. Bad place, right? And what happened to the southern kingdom? The Babylonians took them into captivity. How many years? 70 years. And then God brought them back home. And one of the men that God used when he brought them back home to rebuild Jerusalem, and specifically the walls around Jerusalem, which would be their security system. That's how they were protected from enemies, was that wall around the city. A man by the name of Nehemiah. And you're going to learn about Nehemiah today in Sunday school. And that's where he fits in God's story. God used Nehemiah to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem so Jerusalem could be a city again. Because 400 or so years later, God's going to whisper to a young girl by the name of Mary. He's going to say, Mary, there's a little baby in your tummy, and you're going to name that baby Jesus. That's right. So Nehemiah's part in the big story is so important. Here's what I don't want you to ever forget, and I don't want you to ever forget. This biblical timeline that we do every week, you have a place in this timeline too. I hear people sometimes say, man, I wished I lived during biblical days. You are living in biblical days, right? We're on the other end of this timeline over here. This glorious end where it's all coming to its fulfillment and its fruition. And I don't want you guys to ever forget about that, that you are just important to God as Nehemiah was important to God as Abraham and Noah. And God's got a purpose and a plan for you. There is no reason that a child of God should ever feel like they are bored with their existence. You have God-sized purpose and God-sized potential living in you because God knows. He knows. He created you. He's made you. He's formed you. He saved you, and he's got an incredible purpose for your life, and you are living in biblical days. Isn't that exciting? Let's invite Mr. Tom Crepine to come, and he's going to pray for us today. He is our deacon today, and I think, is your sweet wife still? Is your sweet wife still out of town? No. No, she's back. No, no, she's still over there. Oh, she's still over there. Yeah, she gets to come back. Uh, Miss Darlene is in the Holy Land. Yeah, she's coming back uh, Sunday, Sunday. Yeah, I just Sunday. talked to uh, the leader of that. Uh, I'm actually, you're invited to go with me. I'm planning to lead a tour to the Holy Land. I've never gotten to lead a tour before, but I'm going to get to do that in May of 2021. And I'd love for you to go and to be a part of that. I'm excited at that opportunity. And Darlene's with a friend of hers who's going with the same people that Mm -hmm. that we're going to be going with. So I talked to him on the phone yesterday, and he said they're having a great time. Yes, he's really excited about it. Fantastic. Well, thank you, brother. Would you pray for us? Yes. Uh, Let's pray, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for what you've done for us. Thank you for taking care of us like you're taking care of Eli. We showed so much love for him, but you showed more love for us. Mm -hmm. And we thank you so much. Thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to come to church and worship you. But especially, Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and what he did for each and every one of us here. One day we're going to get to stand in front of him, and we just thank you for that opportunity. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 See you later, boys and girls. They're amazing, aren't they? Joshua chapter 10 is where we are today. We're spending some time in the book of Joshua as we have begun a, a new year that is fast, already scooting by, isn't it? Wow, second Sunday of February already. But the book of Joshua is timely for us. It's a book of transition. It's God's bringing his people across the Jordan. They're beginning now to conquer and settle that land that God had promised to Abraham so many years ago. If you were here last Sunday, something kind of happened toward the end of the service last Sunday where we became really aware of the battles that so many people in this room are in. And we, we spent a little time talking about that, really kind of unexpectedly, to be honest. We started talking about that last Sunday at the end of the service. And we just had a time of praying over and with and for each other for the battles that we are in and that we are facing. And so here's what I would like to do. I just want to pick up in that moment, okay? So if you were here, you remember that moment. If you weren't here. I've tried to set the table for you a little bit. We were just very aware in that moment of some of the heaviness and some of the struggles and the battles that were in the room that Sunday. And the reality is they're still in the room today, all over the place, uh, person after person, everybody 
is facing a, a struggle, uh, a battle, some kind of adversity in your life. And so picking up where we left off with that, we want to continue with that in our thoughts today because strangely enough, I didn't really know how God was linking Joshua 9 and 10 together for us, but this is what Joshua 10 is all about. It's a, it's a, it's a chapter about battle. And, and this is what we need to hear today because we all really kind of confessed last week, yes, I'm struggling. Yes, I'm in a battle. And so what I, I want us to talk about from God's word today is how can we as God's people be strong and courageous in the middle of the battle that you're facing? And, and I don't, I'm not saying that word metaphorically like, yeah, you just kind of got a little challenge in your life. There's enormous things going on in lives in this room. I, I know that. I, I don't know all of it, but I know a lot of it. I know some of the stories of the heartbreak that has happened in your lives this week. I know some parents have not slept well this week because of the things going on in your children's lives. I know uh, husbands and wives that have been devastated this week. Just last night, I uh, stopped coming home. I came home uh, last night and thought I would check the mailbox, and I had... um, Three pieces of mail. Two were for my daughter because we're graduating high school and praying for scholarships and all that good stuff. And the third piece of mail was from a fifth grader at Grace Life. Just his first name on the top left-hand corner of the envelope where the return address would go. Just his first name. And, and my personal home address, all written in pencil, little white envelope, little piece of notebook paper inside there. And he was just sharing with me his broken heart. At every level in this room, across every age, there's just tremendous weight and heaviness. And we are in the middle of battles that we did not anticipate. We did not see them coming. We could not even prepare for these things that we're facing. And God's got a word for us today. I'm so thankful for that. In Joshua chapter 10, it is a chapter about battle. And, and I want to talk about how we can be strong and courageous in the middle of our battle. I, I don't have a three-step plan for how to bring the battle to an end today for you. I so wish that I could. I so wish that at 1230 today, we would all sit down at the lunch table and we would be relieved of all the pressures and all the strain and all the stress, and all the anxiety, and all the fears, and all the worries, and all the heaviness, and all the fatigue of life. I so wish we could sit down and have one meal like that. And we will, but it's not going to be this side of glory. But there is a meal coming, praise God. We're going to slide up to a table one day, that day's coming, and it is going to be stress-free. It is going to be pressure-free. It is going to be disease-free. It is going to be sin-free. It is going to be strife-free. We're going to be at the table of the Lord. That day's coming. But until that day has come, we need to hear from God today. How can we be strong and courageous in the day that we're in? How can we be strong and courageous in the battles that we're facing? Joshua chapter 10, a battle chapter. And I want to talk to you today about battling from three different perspectives. And as we talk about battle from three different perspectives, that's going to set us up then to talk about how to be strong and courageous in the battle that you're in. All right. So if you're a note taker, let me give you the three battle perspectives that we're going to deal with today. We're going to look first of all at the battle fought in history, the battle fought in history in Joshua chapter 10. Then we're going to talk about the battle fought in human minds. The battle fought in history, the battle fought in human minds. And then third, and this is where our battle is, we're going to talk about the battle in the heavenlies. Because that's the battle that we're facing. It's a spiritual battle that we're facing. If you think you have an enemy that has a zip code, that's not your enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our battle is in spiritual realms. We're going to talk about that today. So first, let's see the battle that's fought in history in Joshua chapter 10. You may remember what happened last week, and if you don't, I'll just quickly sort of recap that, that when Joshua and the Israelites had crossed over the Jordan River 
all of the kings and all of the peoples that lived in the land of Canaan, they were terrified. They had heard about how God had parted the Red Sea and brought these people out of Egypt. And then, 40 years later, they heard how God stopped the flow of the Jordan River at flood stage and brought his people across on dry ground. And so the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, they were a terrified people. And you you probably remember some of that from last week. And so these kings in Canaan, they got together and they formed a coalition. They decided our only hope against Israel and Joshua and their God, our only hope is that we join forces together. And and if we all could come together, these six kings, if we could all come together and attack Israel, this is our only hope, this is our only chance. But there was apparently one of those six kings who when he returned back to his city called Gibeon, maybe he had another plan or maybe an advisor suggested another plan somebody must have gotten in this king's ear and said listen even with all six of us forming a coalition against Israel we still don't have a chance and so if we want to save ourselves and we want to save Gibeon here's what we're going to do we're going to send some old scraggly looking dudes to talk to Joshua in Israel and we're going to give them old worn out sacks and wine skins and we're going to give them old moldy bread And we're going to give them some acting lessons. And they're going to go to Joshua and Israel. And they're going to say, we've come from such a far away country. Would you please make a peace treaty with us? And that's what happened last week in Joshua chapter 9. And Joshua and the Israelites made this terrible mistake that they acted on their instincts. They followed their senses. They followed their heart. They did not consult with the Lord. And they just agreed to enter into this treaty with these people that they were given the impression had come from hundreds and hundreds of miles away when the reality is they had come from about 50 miles away and God had already explicitly said you're not supposed to have a peace treaty with any of these people you have to eradicate them from the land but now they're not doing that because they didn't consult with the Lord and now they can't sin against the Lord by going back on this contract because they've got to honor their word so now they're in this alliance with the king of Gibeon and the Gibeonites. And before the ink is dry on the contract, Israel finds out the truth of what's really happened. But they honor their word nevertheless. Now back in chapter 9, it had told us, it had alluded to the fact that there were six kings forming this coalition. But now those six kings are down to five. And apparently the word got to those other five kings. Now they know. Without, without Gibeon, a great city and a great army and their king, the five of us and our armies and our kingdoms, we don't stand a chance against Israel. The only way we had a fighting shot to survive the Israelites is if all six of our kingdoms had come together. And so they came up with a plan. Now they're going to double cross the double crossers. The five kings decide we're going to go and we're going to attack Gibeon. Our only hope is to conquer Gibeon. Maybe we can turn them back to fighting with us because we have no other option that's really a viable option. And Gibeon is a great city with a great army. So they set out to attack Gibeon. We'll pick it up in verse 6, Joshua chapter 10. The men of Gibeon quickly sent messengers to Joshua at his camp in Gilgal, which is about 15 miles away now from Gibeon. And they said to Joshua, don't abandon your servants now, they pleaded. Come at once, save us, help us. For all the Amorite kings who live in the hill country have joined forces to attack us. So Joshua and his entire army, including his best warriors, left Gilgal and set out for Gibeon. And as I read that, I found myself kind of feeling like I'm watching one of those scary movies where the people are running from the monster into the woods And you're watching it going, no, what are you thinking? Don't run into the woods. And I kind of felt like that. Joshua had the wool pulled over his eyes back in Joshua chapter 9 by these people. How do you know this is not another hoax? Joshua, how do you know this is not another trap? How do you know they're not luring you into Gibeon to whoop up on you? We find the answer to that in verse 8. Do not be afraid of them, the Lord said to Joshua. In chapter 9, he didn't hear from the Lord. 
He didn't inquire of the Lord. Apparently in chapter 10, he's learned his lesson. His ear is tuned to the voice of the Lord now. And the Lord said to him, Don't be afraid of them, for I've given you victory over them. Not a single one of them will be able to stand up to you. Joshua traveled all night from Gilgal, and he took the Amorite armies by surprise. So Joshua mobilizes his army, and they move quickly through the middle of the night, and they completely catch this coalition army off guard. And now the coalition army is caught between the Israelites and the Gibeonites. Military strategists call this the pensive maneuver, the pincer maneuver. They're caught now in the middle of that. Verse 10 says, The Lord threw them into a panic, and the Israelites slaughtered great numbers of them at Gibeon. Then the Israelites chased the enemy along the road to Beth Horon, killing them all along the way to Azekah and Mekedah. As the Amorites retreated down the road from Beth Horon, the Lord destroyed them with a terrible hailstorm from heaven that continued until they reached Azekah. The hail killed more of the enemy than the Israelites killed with the sword. And Joshua knows what a strategic moment this is in the war. He knows what a strategic moment this is in the conquering of the land of Canaan and these other people groups. And he knows that he needs just a little bit more time to get this done. He's got an opportunity. Think of what God's done now. God's brought five kings and kingdoms and armies to Joshua all at one time. They're not going to have to spread these battles out. Over months, they're not going to have to travel from city to city to take on these armies. God's brought them to their front door. And Joshua knows if we just had a little bit more time today, we could finish this thing out. And from here on out, conquering the land of Canaan, at least the southern part of the land of Canaan, is going to be a downhill effort after that. This is a big moment. This is really the beginning of the end for the Canaanites, this is how quickly this victory has come. And Joshua knows if they can get this done on this day, they're all set. And this is a huge moment because God's promises hang on this battle. God's prophecies hang on this battle. The promise of God sending a Messiah into the world hangs on this particular battle. And Joshua realizes that everything is in perfect position now for an epic victory over all of his enemies. He just needs a little more time. That'd be nice, right? We all would like to have a little more time. We think that. Truth is, if we had 25 hours yesterday, we would have still wanted a little more time. It's usually not a time issue. It's what we do with the time that's the issue. But Joshua's got a real issue here. He just needs a little more time. And so Joshua steps up, and I think in what is a moment where he is filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with faith, here's what Joshua says, verse 12. On the day the Lord gave the Israelites victory over the Amorites, Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of all the people of Israel, and he said, Let the sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still. And the moon stayed in place until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. Is this not recorded in the book of Jashar? The sun stayed in the middle of the sky and it did not set as on a normal day. There's never been a day like this one before or since when the Lord answered such a prayer. Surely the Lord fought for Israel that day. Then Joshua and the Israelite army returned to their camp at Gilgal. This is the battle as it's fought in history. I just wanted you to see the historical context of this battle. But now I want you to see the second battle. And that's the battle of human reasoning. The battle of human reasoning. The battle in human history was fought with human soldiers. The battle of human reasoning is fought with human scholars. And these scholars, these men and women, they read Joshua chapter 10 and they try to discredit it. They try to say, there's no way that this happened. This is an impossibility. It's ridiculous to say that the sun stopped in the sky. It's ridiculous to say that time stood still. This is just a myth. These scholars, they would say today, we know this didn't happen because we know the sun is not moving. The sun is revolving, or uh, the earth is revolving around the sun 
not the other way around. Well, yes, scientists believe that now, but 150 years ago, they, they, they didn't exactly believe that way. In fact, we do know that the sun is moving because the whole universe is moving. The whole universe is expanding. Dr. Hubble discovered that in about 1925. So we know that everything is moving. The sun does move. But more than that, when Joshua speaks about the sun moving, think about this. That's no different than the way our scientists speak about the sun today, is it? What's your local favorite meteorologist tonight? Whichever one that may be. We all know who it probably is. And tonight... With this great scientific education, he's going to make a statement that goes like this. The sunset time today was, and the sunrise time tomorrow is. And these scholars aren't screaming at the meteorologists and going, no, the sun doesn't move. It doesn't rise. It doesn't set. But he's speaking in a way that conveys our understanding from our human perspective. So why would we argue with the way that it's written in the book of Joshua, in the battle of human reasoning, some will say that what's recorded in Joshua chapter 10 is impossible because it contradicts with the laws of nature. Let me give you Pastor Joel's worldview. I don't believe in the laws of nature. I believe in the laws of God. God does not operate according to the laws of nature. The laws of nature operate according to the laws of God. That's, I hear some amens, that must be your worldview as well. That's the way that I view the world, that God is in control. See, in order to have a law, you have to have somebody that has enough authority and enough power to create that law. You have to have somebody that has enough authority and enough power to enforce that law. So are these scholars saying that the God who has enough power and authority to make a law, the God who has enough power and authority to enforce the law, doesn't have enough power and authority to rescind that law. Do you really think that the one who makes the clock can't make it stop if he wants to make it stop? Do you really think that the Creator is now somehow overpowered by His creation? Not a chance. God's God. And he can do whatever he pleases. And he doesn't need anybody to vote on it. He doesn't need anybody's approval. He's God all by himself. And that's good news for us. There's nothing you're going to do that ever messes up his godness. He transcends all of us. God can set aside a law that he has placed in nature. Or God can even use a law in nature that you and I or nobody even knows exist. And just how God did what he did in Joshua chapter 10, I have no idea. But I know he did it. So we've seen the battle that's fought in history. That's fought by human soldiers. We've seen the battle that's fought in human reasoning. That's fought by human scholars. Now I want to see our battle. The third battle, the battle in the heavenlies. The battle in history was fought by human soldiers. The battle in the human reasoning was fought by human scholars. The battle in the heavenlies is fought by saints, human saints. That's me and you. When you trust Jesus Christ to save you, the Bible calls you a saint. The Bible no longer identifies you as a sinner. doesn't mean we don't sin. We do sin. But we're not sinners, we're saints who sometimes sin. And this battle in the heavenlies is fought by you and me. You're fighting it every single day. It's a spiritual battle. That's why I say it's in the, in the heavenlies. It's not a physical battle. It has physical elements to it, yes. It can feel awfully earthly and physical, but there's more to what's going on in your life and my life than what we see with our eyes, what we hear with our ears, what we can touch, what we experience with our senses. So let's talk about the battle that's happening in the heavenlies. A lot of you raised your hands last week to say, I'm in it. You're still in it today. Like Joshua and Israel, we're battling this demonic-inspired people 
in Cain, and we're in spiritual battles too. Ephesians chapter 6, we saw it last week, we'll look at it again. Verse 12, Paul says, We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. I'm glad he put the phrase unseen world in there, because we're so political today, we would see evil rulers and we would think Democrats, we would think Republicans, we would think Donald Trump. We would think Nancy Pelosi. We're not talking about that here. We're talking about a much bigger battle that's going on in our lives. And by the way, there's a battle behind all of those battles that are going on too. But don't forget this. It is our God that causes kings and kingdoms to rise and fall. He's in control. He's sovereign. Give yourself a break from watching the news 24-7. He's writing it. He's writing it. He's in control. All right, it's 2020, it's an election year. Keep your nose in the book and out of the TV and off the social media. That's not going to do you any good, I promise you that. Pray, pray for all those people. Pray for those who are in those positions of leadership and authority. But it is a lousy hobby, all right? It just really, it really is. That's free for you and you can argue with me if you'd like. And I'm sure you'll win because you're more bitter than I am because you're watching news all (laughs) the time. Uh, I'm not. I'm having a good time in my life. I'm not dumb or oblivious, but I'm just, I got too many good things to do besides hear people yell on the top of each other all the time. All right. Wow, that was a lot of free information. (laughs) Paul says, back to what Paul said here, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world. You want to know what's wrong with our world? It, this is what's wrong with our world. Paul's describing it 2,000 years ago. And against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That's the battles that we're fighting. That's what's going on behind the scenes. They're spiritual battles, heavenly battles. They happen on earth. They're earthly in nature and our situations. But behind all of that are all these dark, demonic, spiritual forces that are functioning and operating. Yes, I believe that's real. I have no doubt that that's real. I know it's real from God's word. I, I know it's real from my experiences. And I don't need my experiences. God's word is enough, but it's real. I know it's real. You know it's real. I think you do. It's real. And you're facing a lot of battles today, and God knew you would. Can I just let you know this today? When God wrote Joshua chapter 10, he had you in mind. When he wrote Joshua chapter 10, he had you and the battle that you're in today. He had that in mind. He did. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible says so. Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he's talking about the days of Moses and Joshua and the Israelites. And listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11. These things happen to them as examples for us. Think about that. Joshua 9, 10. It happened to them, God says, to be an example to us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Those of us who live on this end of the timeline. He wrote Joshua chapter 10 back here on this end of the timeline for the benefit of those of us who are living on this end of the timeline. This isn't just history <clears throat> that we're reading, knocking the dust off. No, this is a God-given word of encouragement and hope, an example to us that in whatever battle it is that you might be facing, you can be strong and you can be courageous. And that brings me back to the question, how can we? How can we be strong and courageous in the battles That we're facing. God had repeatedly told Joshua to do that. All the way back to Joshua chapter 1. Moses is dead. Now you be strong and courageous. And he repeated that over and over to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. There's going to be battle after battle after battle. But be strong and courageous. How can we be strong and courageous? I believe we can be. And I believe we will be. When we remember and we rejoice in three certainties about God. You might want to jot these down. When you remember and you rejoice in three certainties about God, 
It won't end your battle necessarily. It'll give you strength in your battle. It'll give you courage and hope in the middle of your battle. Here's the first certainty. You can count on God's word. You can count on God's word. You know, one of the things that happens when we get into a battle is we, we don't really know what we can count on anymore. Some of you are in a battle today where the things that you thought were most firm, most sure, now have been exposed to not be. You don't know what you can count on. I'm telling you today what you can count on. You can count on God's word. You can trust the word of God. You might not fully understand it. Scholars might attack it. But this book can be trusted. If it says that the sun stood still, the sun stood still. If it says that the stone rolled away, the stone rolled away. You can take it to the bank. I don't get to edit the parts of the Bible that I don't understand. I'm just the newsboy. I just deliver the paper to you every single Sunday. He didn't call me to be his editor. He just called me to deliver the paper. And I try to lay it on your doorstep every single Sunday with a front page side up. And it's the same headline every Sunday that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Have you noticed I deliver the same message every week? I don't know how I'm getting away with this. I get paid to preach the same thing every single week. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. There is no other message. We can trust the Bible. It's God's word. Throughout history, it's faced innumerable Enemies. We just talked about some of that in the Sunday school class that I teach at 8 o'clock. Still, far and away, the best 8 o'clock Sunday school class in the whole church. Somebody's going to challenge that one day and start another 8 o'clock class, all right? That'll be a good challenge. We talked about that. People have paid dearly because of God's Word through the years. People have wanted to destroy the Word of God, attack the Word of God, remove the Word of God, replace the Word of God, and yet it stands. In fact, the Bible says the grass and the flowers, they may fall and fade, but the word of God endures forever. There's only two things that we get to touch and see in this world that we're going to spend eternity with. That's people and God's word. That's the only thing that's transitioning from here to there. You can count on God's word. I don't know what the battle is that you're in, but I'm telling you God's word is for you. You can count on God's word. God is who his word says he is. Jesus has done and will do what his word says he has done and will do. You are who his word says that you are. You can count on the perfect, inspired, infallible, applicable, authoritative word of God. That word is for you and there is no other word like it in all of the world. If Joshua and the Israelites were determined to keep their word to the Gibeonites, how much more do you think God is determined to keep his word to you? I hope you love God's word. I hope you do. I hope you're spending time with God's word. I'm thankful I get to lay the newspaper at your doorstep every single Sunday, but God's delivering it to your doorstep every single day. He didn't need me to do it on Sunday. I'm just glad he called me to do it. He can do it without me. He can do it better without me, in fact, I'm sure. But you don't need me. God wants you to be in his word daily, often in your life. And that's the only way you can walk through these battles that you're facing. That's the only way in the battle you're going to be strong and courageous is you've got to be armed with God's word. If you don't know where to start reading God's word, if you're in a Sunday school class that's doing the gospel project, there's a, there's a reading plan, daily reading plan. That's a great place. Just go with that. I think we're posting that on social media. I know some of y'all do social media. God help you. But put it, it's on social media. I know some of y'all are going to write me, oh, you don't like social media. Whatever, it works for you, that's fine, whatever. But use that, all right? And, and then there's questions at the end of that. What would be a beautiful thing is for groups of men to get together later in the week and talk about the scriptures they've been reading out of that together. There's questions in that that you can walk through together. It would be great to see women in those classes.
classes later in the week, getting together. You don't have to just be with people in your Sunday school class. Cross over, be with some other people who are in some other classes. Fellowship around God's word like that. The Bible's got to be the foundation of our life. You need to be operating day to day in your battle in the confidence of God's word. You can trust God's word. You can count on God's word. How can you be strong and courageous in the battle that you're facing? We need to remember and rejoice in three certainties. Number one, you can count on God's word. Number two, you can count on God's care. He cares. He does. Verse 14 of Joshua chapter 10. When the dust was settling... Verse 14 says, there's never been a day like this one before or since when the Lord answered such a prayer. He's a God that cares, isn't he? He's a God that hears our prayers. He's a God that answers our prayers. And look at the last line of verse 14. Surely the Lord, Yahweh, fought for Israel that day. Some of you may be saying, I wish God cared enough for me. That he'd fight for me. I wish God cared enough for me. That he'd fight for me. Well, he will. If you let him. He will fight for you. If you'll let him. You might say, well, how do I get him on my side? You don't. You get on his side. Some of you are in some battles right now where there's a his side and a her side, a their side and my side. It's always adversarial in some way. You don't worry about sides. You get on God's side. You remember that night that Joshua was out surveying Jericho? And he got really close to the walls of Jericho. Then he looked up and there's a man standing there with his sword drawn. And Joshua said, hey, whose side are you on? Us, our enemy. And the man said, neither. Neither. But as the commander of the armies of Yahweh, I have come. I didn't come to take sides. I've come to take over. And you're invited to get on his side. And he fights for those who are on his side. I know you're in a battle, but be sure of this. God has a plan. And when we line up with God's plan... When we get on his side, he's going to fight for us. He cares for us. If you want to be victorious in the battle, you figure out where God's going and you go with him. Quit this business of I'm going this way, Lord bless this. (laughs) No, the Lord's going, I'm going this way. If you want to know blessings, then you just come along with me. And you can't know where he's going. You can't know what he's doing if you're not in his word. Can I just go back to point one real quick? Right? How can you know? Romans 12.1 says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might know what the will of God is. Well, how can your mind be being transformed if you're not spending time consistently in God's word? You can count on this. God cares for his people. He will fight for you. That doesn't mean that you don't do anything. Joshua had his part to play. They had things they had to do. They had to fight, but God was fighting with them, and God was fighting for them. And you may not know exactly what it is you're supposed to do, but you do the next right thing that you're supposed to do. You keep walking step by step with the Lord. And according to His Word, His Word is a lamp unto my feet. Sometimes it's just going to show you the next step. I don't know how to go from A to Z. You're not supposed to know how to go from A to Z. God's Word is going to help you get from A to B. And B to C and C to D. And eventually you'll get to Z. But you can't pass through element OP. God cares for his people. How can you be strong and courageous in your battles? You've got to remember and rejoice in these three certainties about God. You can count on his word. You can count on his care. And third and finally, you can count on God's power. Joshua chapter 10 goes on to tell us that Joshua and the Gibeonites, their armies, they had an incredible victory that day. God rained down hailstones even that day. And the story also goes on to tell us that those five kings, I kind of walked out in the 1045 service last week with a grin on my face because I said, if you want to find out what happened to those five kings, come back next week. 
And a few people do this week are going, I got, I got to figure out what's happening to these five kings. Well, I'm about to tell you. The story goes on to tell us that those five kings had, during the battle, been hiding out in a cave. Trying to stay out of the path of hailstorms, hailstones, right? But they were discovered by Joshua and his men. Verse 22 says, Then Joshua said, Remove the rocks covering the opening of the cave and bring the five kings to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. When they brought them out, Joshua told the commanders of his army, Come and put your feet on the king's necks. And they did as they were told. And with all these feet on the necks of these kings, Joshua says this in verse 25. He says this to the people of God. Don't ever be afraid. And don't ever be discouraged. This will not be our last battle. We will face more enemies. But today will serve to remind you that God's people don't ever have to be afraid. God's people don't ever have to be discouraged. Joshua told his men, be strong. You're looking at the text, verse 25, be strong and courageous. How? Because Yahweh is going to do this to all of your enemies. You're His. You belong to Him. And Yahweh is going to do this to all of your enemies. Listen, that is a word for you today. And whatever it is that's going on in your life, that's a word for us. Those words are for you who can't even be here in this room today because you're too sick to be here. Those words are for those of you who are at home because your anxiety was raging too hard for you to be in this room today. These words are for you whose marriage is crumbling beneath your feet. These words are for that fifth grader who wrote his pastor a note this week. These words are for those of you that are here, but your unbelieving spouse is not. Those words are for those of you that are here, but your wayward children are not. Those words are for all of us. Don't ever be afraid or discouraged. Be strong and courageous. Because Yahweh is going to do this to all your enemies. He's going to do this to your sin. He's going to do this to your grave. He's going to do this to your shame. He's going to do this to your guilt. He's going to do this to your fear. He's going to do this to your anxiety. He's ultimately going to do this to your sickness. He's going to do this to your disease. And Joshua said this as they stood on the necks. Of those defeated kings. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 16. He says the God of peace. Will soon crush Satan. Under your feet. Under your feet. Our enemy. Is already defeated. Our Joshua, his name is Jesus, and he already has our enemy underneath his foot. Because of his sinless life, his substituting death, his resurrection from the grave, he has made us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. He has made me and you more than conquerors. And we're in Christ So when he puts his foot on the neck of our enemy, it's our foot in the foot of Christ that's on the neck of our enemy. And Paul says God will soon crush Satan under our feet. 
Joshua moved the stones in front of the cave and they stood on the necks of their enemies. And Jesus moved the stone in front of another cave and he stood on the neck of our enemy. And that's why, and that's how you and I can walk out of this place with battle still raging, but we can walk out not being afraid, not being discouraged. We can be strong and we can be courageous because Jesus has already won the battle for us. And he's inviting you today. Put your foot right here. and Stand with me. Put your foot right here and believe. God, we are battle-weary. and We needed to hear this word from you. And you, in your gracious sovereignty, you delivered the news today right on time. There's a fifth grader hanging by a thread. There's a marriage that the enemy has backed into the corner. There's a person who's at the end of their rope. The last thing that our enemy wanted us to hear today is that all the mess he is stirring up, he's doing it with the foot of Jesus on his neck. He's conquered, he's defeated. We believe what Jesus did at the cross. We believe the stone was moved and he came out of the grave. We believe your word when it says soon. We won't just stand with our foot in the foot of Jesus on the neck of our enemy, but soon he will be crushed beneath our feet. And all that has gone madly wrong in this world will be made gloriously right. We believe. With your heads bowed and with your eyes closed, would you today, right where you are, would you just stand and in your mind, would you just put your foot down in faith, trusting God and His goodness and His word and His care and His power. Just in a physical expression right now, whoever you may be, whatever may be going on, you just are compelled, I need to stand right now and just put my weight on one foot and I need to believe. I need to believe that Jesus is my victory. Holy Spirit, you hear our hearts and you know our pain and we thank you for your care and we're not asking you to get on our side today. God, get us on your side. We want to worship you in spirit and truth. We want to lay our lives down before you. We want to yield ourselves to you. We want to recognize that you are God and we're not. God, would you strengthen your people today? Would you pour your spirit out and give grace and give comfort and give confidence? May we stand with our foot planted today. May fear and discouragement flee in the presence of faith that is squarely placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you to do this because we desperately need you to. In Jesus' name. There is love that came for us, humble to a sinner's cross. You broke my shame in sin.
the storm and through the fire. There is truth that sets me free. Jesus Christ who lives in me. You are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken. You have saved is risen Jesus you
Lord, we bless your name. There's none like you. We couldn't go without you. We don't want to go without you. We thank you that you have through your son Jesus made a covenant with us that will never be broken. We're your people. We belong to you. and We are more than conquerors because of Jesus. I wish your pastor could make your battle stop. I can't. That's not my job. But my job is to, as best I can, point you to the one who will make it stop. He will. He will. In the meantime, you count on his word. You count on his care. And you count on his power. And you remember where he has placed your foot. And don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. Because the Lord your God is with you. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? 